I'm standing on Mount Scopus, overlooking what has to be the most important city in all of human history. Muslims, Jews, and Christians travel from all over the globe just to walk in its streets and worship in its shrines. Having done so, they consider it a most unforgettable experience in a most unforgettable city. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth, if I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. Why would this unnamed poet of Psalm 137 utter such words? Why would he consider Jerusalem such an unforgettable city? Let's go see what we can discover. Jerusalem is even by today's standard a beautiful city. It has a splendor all its own, a splendor that can be seen as you gaze out over the old city walls with the Muslim Dome of the Rock glistening like the sun and the imposing presence of the old city walls boasting so proudly of its strength and heritage. Most of the walls you see today were built in the 16th century AD under the order of a Sultan of the Ottoman Empire named Suleiman the Magnificent. The remnants of other walls that are still visible in various parts of the city were built during Bible times and, and also are a testament to Jerusalem being a highly prized and, and truly unforgettable place. But why? Why was Jerusalem so highly prized and, and why did it come to be built where it was? First, Jerusalem is so unforgettable because of its water source. Early civilizations settled here in this part of the hill country because of the Gihon Spring. This spring is located on the eastern side of the eastern hill at the edge of the Kidron Valley, and it's been a vital part of the city's existence from the beginning. Over the years, this spring has been explored and expanded by various civilizations, all trying to create a water channel, bringing its life-giving sustenance within the protection of the city walls. That water sustained the existence of generations of inhabitants who were dependent upon its life-giving flow for refreshment and for survival. Water, however, wasn't the only reason why Jerusalem was so unforgettable. It was also important because of its position. It was relatively remote and secure. When studying the Bible lands, you'll note that there are several geographic zones. Some of those zones include the coastal plain, the Jezreel Valley, the Jordan Rift Valley, the Transjordanian Mountains, the Judean Wilderness, the Negev Basin, and the Hill Country. Jerusalem is in the Hill Country, located 35 miles east of the seacoast and some 20 miles due west of the northern tip of the Dead Sea. Nestled at the edge of the old tribal territory of the Benjamites, Judah's capital city was a good distance away from the international north-south trade route which ran along the Mediterranean coastline and the other trade route that ran along the Transjordanian mountains. The remote location of the hill country not only kept Jerusalem out of the main traffic area of invading armies, but it also allowed individuals like King David to effectively manage the major part of the Promised Land as it lay just south of an important crossroads on the central Benjamite Plateau, which was the heartland of the territory belonging to the Israelites. Using the crossroads of the Benjamite territory, Jerusalem could maneuver its armies quickly in any direction. Because the people in Jerusalem had control of north and south travel on these smaller arteries, as well as east and west going from the Jordan to the Sea of Galilee. They had control over things like travel and trade. They would be able to respond to any military movements that might arise. They could go to the west and end up at the Mediterranean port of Joppa. They could go to the east, travel over the north side of the Dead Sea, and arrive at the plains of Moab, and really have control over affairs that took place in the eastern tribal boundaries. 
Not only was Jerusalem an unforgettable city because of its water source and because of its location, but also because of its topography. The Jewish poet who penned Psalm 137 would most certainly have had in mind the hills and the valleys of this marvelous place and how they provided a sort of natural defense for the people of God. In the ancient world, when choosing a suitable building site, city dwellers were faced with two important factors regarding their decision. Placing the city on some sort of mound or hill was first of great importance. Militarily, it was always easier to defend a city if you possessed the high ground. Now the second, as we've already noted, involved a water source, and Jerusalem met both of these important needs. Roughly speaking, the city of Jerusalem can be visualized as sitting on a rise in the bottom of a large bowl where the rim of the bowl is higher than the rise within it. Over the years, as the city expanded westward, it was built on two parallel north-south ridges. The western ridge, which is the higher and broader of the two, is bounded on the west by the Hinnom Valley. This valley, which begins northwest of the city, turns due south and then due east, forming distinctive limits on the western and southern sides of that ridge. The narrower and lower eastern ridge is bounded on the east by the Kidron Valley, which in the Jerusalem area flows basically north to south. After being joined by the Hinnom, the Kidron turns to the southeast and proceeds through the barren Judean desert down to the Dead Sea. During Bible times, these valleys were significant in that invading armies would find it difficult to approach or attack Jerusalem from the south, the east, or the west. The immediate environment of Jerusalem was crenellated. We had these valleys and gorges and things that essentially sliced the city up, we might say. The inhabitants of the city made use of those features. They depended upon them for protection. They had to navigate and negotiate those when they were dealing with invaders or, or repelling those who would come and take a part of the city. For this reason, citadels were often constructed in the northern and western parts of the city and around entry points where invasion was most likely and where the depth of the valleys were not nearly as pronounced. The topography of Israel in general is very striking. It starts out on a very low-lying hill as a Canaanite city before David conquers it. In the ancient world, you did want to have mountainous terrain and higher elevations. It did make defending the city easier. Jerusalem proper and its surrounding territorial jurisdiction also included several so-called mountains or hills. The first of these hills is known as Ophel, which is actually the southern extension of the Temple Mount area and was the location for the ancient palace of King David, the remains of which can still be seen today. Its southern extension is known as the Spur of Ophel, also known as the Eastern Hill. This hill is in the shape of a large peninsula-like finger, bounded on the east by the Kidron Valley, on the west by the Central Valley, and on the south by the Hinnom Valley. Ophel and its spur contained the ancient city of David and was the original site of the Jebusite fortified dwelling before it fell under the control of David and his armies. David would have potentially seen Jerusalem as a crown jewel fit for his kingdom. And so he captures the city from its Jebusite inhabitants and makes it the capital of God's kingdom. Another important hill in Jerusalem is known as Mount Zion. In Hebrew literature, the word Zion was often used as a symbol for the dwelling place of God. And it's most often associated with the Temple Mount area, also known as Mount Moriah. This mountain or hill is by tradition identified as the mountain in the land of Moriah upon which Abraham offered Isaac. The word Moriah means foreseen by God, and so it was that God foresaw the sacrifice of his own son in the same city in which his temple would be built and Abraham would seek to sacrifice Isaac. It was on this mountain that David purchased a threshing floor from Ornan the Jebusite and that both the Solomonic and Herodian temple complexes were built. While the traditional site for Mount Zion is on the Temple Mount, modern day Mount Zion is located on the western hill with much of it inside the present day city walls. The western hill did not become a part of the city proper until around the seventh century BC. This hill, during the time of Jesus, contained the upper to middle class residents 
as well as the Hasmonean Palace, the residence for the high priest, and King Herod's mansion as well. It was on this site that the Crusaders identified the alleged sites of King David's tomb and the upper room where Jesus and his disciples partook of the Passover meal. The old city wall of today runs westward through the center of the western hill and then turns north to run along its ridge. To the east of Jerusalem is the long continuous ridge on which the Mount of Olives and the Hill of Offense are located. It runs north to south and it's parallel to the Kidron Valley. In the Bible, the ridge where the Mount of Olives is located was first mentioned in 2 Samuel 15, 23 in regard to David's flight during Absalom's revolt. In New Testament times, Jesus was known to have frequented this area and from this mountain made his ascension into heaven. Near the base of the Mount of Olives, there's a site which contains a garden of olive trees. And here, it is believed that Jesus spent the night in prayer just prior to his crucifixion. However, the word Gethsemane means place of the press. And just north of the traditional site for the garden, a cave has been discovered containing an ancient olive press. Many believe this to be the actual location where Jesus and his disciples spent the night following the Passover preceding his death. To the south of the Mount of Olives and yet still a part of the main north-south ridge, a site has been identified as the Hill of Offense. According to 1 Kings 11, Solomon built altars here or high places in honor of the pagan gods Kamosh and Molech. Thus, the site became an offense to God and to this day is known by this epitaph. In addition to the natural security that the topography of Jerusalem provided, this place was an unforgettable city because of its fascinating history as well. Many of the great stories of the Bible take place with Jerusalem as its backdrop. Who could have forgotten how King David, through a brilliant military maneuver, conquered the city from the Jebusites by climbing up a water shaft and infiltrating the city by surprise? I can only imagine how that story must have shined well in Israelite military lore. And the remarkable engineering feats of men like Hezekiah, who fortified the city and also dug a tunnel through the eastern hill. And likewise, who could fail to remember the building projects of King Uzziah? Jerusalem was and is today teeming with captivating and heart-rending stories of the past, both of elation and heartbreak. Regardless of who we are, whether we're Americans in the 21st century or Jewish exiles in the 6th century BC, Jerusalem would have been a wonderful and marvelous place. And for the Jews in particular, their attention and thoughts and prayers would have been directed back toward Jerusalem to this fantastic city that emerged in this golden age of David and Solomon and all of the history that went behind about what made it such a powerful city. Blessed by God, a capital of God's people. Uh, I think there was much there that would have been amazing for them to, to think about and remember while they were in a foreign country. But then perhaps the most significant reason that a Jew of captivity would have found it difficult to forget Jerusalem would not just have been its location, its water source, topography, and history, but also the temple itself. North of the city of David lay the grand and marvelous dwelling place of God, where once his majestic presence could be found in the Holy of Holies above the cherubim. When they bring the tabernacle there and then build the temple there, now it's not just economic and political, but it's religious capital as well. Over time, that's the reason why you see invaders like Nebuchadnezzar come and ultimately storm Jerusalem as the prize to conquer, because that's the center of national life and identity. No matter where you entered the city, no matter where you stood, there was one place that would have dominated the landscape. It was the temple complex. The temple was built by Solomon. David gathered much of the construction materials for it, but his son Solomon is the one who actually builds it. He builds it on top of the, what scholars believe is the south of Mount Moriah, and it is a place where God puts his name. Solomon understands that the temple is a marvelous place, but yet it cannot contain all of God, and he mentions this in his dedicatory uh, prayer in 1 Kings. Though little evidence remains of the temple built by Solomon, 
It is believed that it nonetheless rivaled the grand complex built by Herod the Great in the last century before Christ. Herod's complex was so large and so vast that in order for King Herod to build it, he had to expand the base of the west side of the hill by constructing a large retaining wall which extended into the Central Valley. Today, that retaining wall is still standing and it's considered to be the Jews' holiest of shrines, a small vestige of a once grand and glorious complex. Western Wall is the westernmost retaining wall of the Temple Mount and it is one of the holiest places in the world for observant Jews. Jews pray in the direction of the Western Wall and historically some rabbis have taught that prayers ascend to the throne room of God via the wall. It's sort of like an ancient version of a cell phone tower. If a mere retaining wall is so important to modern Jews, you can just imagine how memorable and impressive the temple complex itself must have been during both the time of Christ and the period of the Jewish monarchy. The footprint of the entire Herodian complex was so large that 26 NFL-sized football fields could be placed on the platform of the complex. Ornately decorated and splendidly designed, the magnificent temple had a beautiful staircase going up 70 feet to the Hall of Hewn Stone where the Sanhedrin once met. This complex, like Solomon's temple, was considered one of the great wonders of the world. This was a holy place, so holy that before one would approach the temple of God, there was a tradition of immersing oneself into a baptistry where the worshiper could be cleansed before coming into the presence of God. We actually live in a very fortunate time in history with regard to the Temple Mount and what we're able to appreciate about it today. For many, many centuries, it was covered by debris. It was subjected to destruction and wars. But in the late 20th century, excavations in that area began to uncover features that had long been hidden from sight. Some of the most significant that were uncovered were the immersion pools or baptistries that were found at the bottom or the southern edge of the temple. There were as many as 50 of those that have been discovered. And we realized just how significant the immersions or the ritual washings that the Jews engaged in, how important they were for those who were about to go up into that holy or sacred space where the temple would have been located. When they went up, the steps were individually different sizes. And so with alternating patterns and depths, people would have to watch their steps. And as a result, it caused the person to have to bend over to look down a little bit. And the people approached the temple in an humble, bent posture that would come to symbolize the type of attitude that an humble worshiper would have as they were coming near the presence of God. Beyond just the grandeur of the complex, think for just a moment about how a Jewish family must have felt as they ascended God's holy hill on their way to this enormous place. Not only would the mere size of it create awe in those who approached it, but consider also the environs of the temple. The smoke from fires, cooking sacrifices, and the incense being burned at the temple must have filled the air with a memorable aroma. The distinctive sounds of singing, celebration, and prayers must have coalesced into a symphony of delight. At night, the temple must have been mesmerizing with the glow of the massive menorahs and torches emitting their light all over Jerusalem and down along its massive walls. The temple complex was a place where families and friends gathered to study the Torah and to be reminded of God's love, His redemptive plan, and His provision for Israel throughout their history. But most of all, it would have been remembered because of what took place there between the sinner and God. The temple was a place for fellowship with God and for celebrating how God had redeemed Israel and how He had worked to make them a nation and how He made provision for the atonement of the sinner. So in thinking about this marvelous city, imagine a grand temple complex once standing where the Dome of the Rock now stands. Imagine its once massive walls of protection similar to the ones we now see. Imagine its unique location as we see it today in the heart of the hill country. Imagine its protective positioning situated on these hills Imagine the ever-flowing Gihon Spring. Imagine the feast days and the fellowship of family and, and friends. And then imagine being carried away into a foreign land 
wondering if you would ever return, I think you might also be compelled to utter these words. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. As we consider the majesty and the importance of both ancient and modern Jerusalem, it should come as no surprise that God would use this place as an important symbol representing the church of Jesus Christ. The Bible reveals that when a sinner is by faith immersed into water for the remission of sins, that the Lord adds this newly saved person to the body of Christ. This body is the collectivity of the saved, known also as the church. The church is designated in Scripture by several terms, including the kingdom of God, the body of Christ, the temple, and according to Hebrews 12.22 and Revelation 21.2, the new Jerusalem. So if the church is the new Jerusalem, and as the church we today stand in awe of the physical city of Jerusalem and its past, how much more should we respect and adore the new Jerusalem, that is to say the church of our Lord, the church of Jesus Christ? I think that even in the minds of Christians, the concept of the church is a, a concept that can grow in significance and grow in appreciation. In the end, the hope is, of course, that we see the church with the same significance that God sees it, that we value those people and the fact that we're all working, heading toward the same eternal destiny. As we examine the beauty and the grandeur of the new Jerusalem and walk within its walls of church membership, work, and worship, we should stand in awe of what it took to build her and the price of her construction. As we enter her gates, our hearts should be filled with excitement and joy over the fellowship to be found there and the forgiveness to be experienced there. Like the Jerusalem of old, we should think of this place as a place of security and protection and a place where our thirst can be quenched not by the waters of Gihon, but by the waters provided by Jesus in the refreshing power of his words. As we consider Jerusalem, may we always remember its beauty, its protection, security, history, and its saving grace where sinner comes into the presence of God. May we all then forever utter these words about the church. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exalt Jerusalem, above my chief joy. I'm convinced that if we understood the real essence and the essential nature of the new Jerusalem, that it would be an unforgettable city and one that would forever live in our hearts and the deep recesses of our mind. The new Jerusalem, the church of our Lord, is truly an unforgettable city. And so may it always be first and foremost in our lives. You are the canyon and I am a crevice. You are the heavens and I am a star. You are the thunder and I am a whisper. Quietly longing to be where you are. Quietly longing to be where you are. I will say that when I saw Jerusalem and the different religious groups that were present, so I think specifically uh, the Jewish presence and even the Muslim presence. I was struck by the degree to which people identify themselves as being a part of this religion or this movement in every facet of their lives. It, it didn't leave me with the impression that they simply go and, and religion is a portion or a component of life and then they go off to business, they go off to recreation, they don't compartmentalize the same way. I was struck by the degree to which all of that is holistically linked with self-definition and self-identity. We are this people, and it's manifested in everything they say and everything they do. I was impressed by that. You can't help but be struck by the fact that this is where our Lord and our Savior once walked. This is where great people of faith once came into the presence of Almighty God. I truly stand in awe of Jerusalem 
not only because of its importance and significance as described in the Bible, but to know what took place there, to know that not only was the temple of God built and established there, and great battles were fought there, but perhaps the greatest and most important event in all of human history took place there, and that was the death, the suffering, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jerusalem is a marvelous city that deserves our attention, not only because of the death of Jesus, but also because it stands as a beautiful parallel and as an illustration of what heaven itself will one day be like.